Well, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to speak to you all um, today. So um, what I was going to do today was give you some insight into some of the thinking that we've been doing at the University of Cambridge. First of all, in terms of bringing together the multidisciplinary expertise we have in Cambridge to help think through how nationally and indeed globally we might look to um, look to, to a green recovery from the current coronavirus cam, uh, pandemic, a, a green recovery that is that is fair and just, but is also resilient and sustainable. And I also want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing within our own institution in Cambridge um, towards addressing um, our own sustainability um, and our own relationship with the wider environment. Um, so let me just share my screen so I can show you my presentation. So I thought I'd start off just with a little bit of context around this. And we were very much when we were thinking about um, you know, what constitutes a fair, just, sustainable and resilient recovery from the pandemic, we were um, very much um, thinking in the context of the need to ensure that a that a recovery means that we don't he fall headlong into the next crisis that might ha hit our um, global society. And in particular, we were cognizant of three key threats that uh, global society faces. And, and the first one is a recognition that there really is extreme social inequality, both within countries and between countries. And here's one statistic that you may already be very familiar with, that the world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. And in a population, global population that's approaching around about 8 billion people, that is a really substantial percentage of the global um, population, extreme disparity of wealth. Um, the second uh, a crisis that we were very cognizant of was the crisis that is affecting our natural world. And again, one headline figure that, that really sets that into context is that a, 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 a very seminal report from just over a year ago um, estimated that around one million species are at risk of extinction in the next few decades. And then, of course, the other key global threat that, it, uh, that everyone is very familiar with is the threat posed by climate change. And that's my own area of research expertise. So I'll, I'll, I'll dwell a little bit um, in terms of the context associated with climate change. But it's very clear that climate change is already being felt around um, the world today in terms of extreme weather affecting the lives and livelihoods of people around the world. So in terms of you know, what a green recovery from the pandemic might look like and how that can be shaped, uh, the opportunities here are for looking to shape a society that is fairer and more just, and at the same time to look to restore nature and address climate change. And if we achieve that, then we could look to achieve a fairer distribution of resources, a more sustainable recovery. And, and there's a lot of evidence um, that actually green investment in green, um, a green recovery, investment in green jobs and green infrastructure and green technologies um, will lead to actually um, substantially better economic returns from that investment than investment in um, in in uh, in in solutions that are not um, green. And I'll come on to explain some of the um, uh, evidence behind that. So let me just dwell a little bit on the, on the climate change um, threat. Uh, today's temperature is just over one degree Celsius warmer than it was 150 years ago. This image shows that warming that's occurred over that last um, 150 years in terms of, uh, of moving from these blue colours on the left hand side in the late 19th century through to these very red colours um, that you see today. And the impacts of that warming can be seen around the world. Um, in the polar regions, we're seeing accelerating ice loss from Greenland and Antarctica. And that together with the warming of the oceans is leading to substantial and accelerating sea level rise. We're seeing temperatures reaching extreme levels. Um, just this last year, we've seen 
uh, wildfires in um, California, in Australia, devastating communities. And, and more widely, we're seeing extreme weather um, increasingly resulting in risks to lives and livelihoods around the world. Just to give you a sense of uh, the scale of the increase um, of the threats posed by climate change, this is some very recent work conducted by my own research group um, in Cambridge, looking at the increase that we are likely to see over the coming decades in terms of the days of disruption caused by extreme heat waves. And uh, what you're seeing here in this plot is the increase in number of extreme disruption days um, caused by heat waves, um, which amount to months of additional disruption in many parts of the world, including um, throughout northern Africa. But perhaps one of the greatest concerns about um, climate change and, and the risks posed by climate change are um, the risks of really catastrophic shocks uh, to the climate system occurring. And I've just got a few examples here, although there are many others I could have shown. Um, the risks of the rapid dieback of the vast Amazon rainforest, the risk of the collapse of the vast ice sheets covering Greenland um, or Antarctica, and the risk of um, the melting of the Arctic resulting in a significant release of methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a much more uh, powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and would uh, result in a significant acceleration of climate change itself. So that's the threat posed by climate change. If we're wanting to respond to that threat in terms of building a, 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 an economy of the future um, that responds to that threat as we move out of the pandemic, then what do we need to be doing as a global society? Well, this plot here shows our current emissions in the white dots over the last few decades of um, carbon dioxide globally. And then you can see the trajectory that we need to be on um, if we are to um, limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And as I already explained, we're at around about one degree Celsius of warming to date. Now, as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown of many societies around the world, emissions in 2020 were somewhat lower um, than in 2019. And you can see that shown there. But that scale of decrease that we saw as a consequence of those global lockdowns was only the amount of decrease that we need to be seeing year on year on year for the next and decades if we are to limit temperature rise. So there's a real challenge in how we shift our global economies from the carbon intensive economies that we have today to um, the a net zero economy um, of the future over a very rapid time frame. And, um, and that's about global society moving to a net zero future. So um, countries that are developing also need to be developing with that as the goal um, in mind over a very short time frame. So what does that look like? This is data from the UK showing how the UK's economy and society needs to evolve over that time period. Um, what I'm showing here is sectors of the economy and how those sectors of the economy um, contributed to the UK's greenhouse gas emissions back in 1990. The transformation that's already occurred um, in the UK economy over the last 30 years, um, and you can see that in the middle image there in terms of the emissions across each of those different sectors. But then the transformation that still needs to occur over the next 30 years if we're to reach a net zero economy by 20. 50. And each of those boxes translates into a real opportunity for um, significant innovation across each of those different sectors. Um, and so if we just look at one example, you know, we're doing this um, meeting today um, through a technology that we wouldn't have envisaged using to anything like the extent we are using it um, today. Um, even a year ago. Um, if we look back 30 years ago, the technologies that were available to us were very, very different. So substantial change can occur rapidly. And the question is, how can innovation help shape our future in a green way um, to help um, all those sectors transform um, into net zero um, 
uh, sectors of the economy. Now, drawing on the research from across the University of Cambridge, looking at each of those sectors, there are real opportunities for innovation helping to drive transformational change. Um, innovations in terms of the energy sector, looking at uh, new materials for battery technologies that are going to be so important in terms of moving to clean energy um, infrastructure. Looking at the transport sector, um, again, looking at zero carbon transport, whether that is ground transport or um, zero carbon aviation. In agriculture, very important um, sector, looking both at how we can develop sustainable agriculture, um, either through uh, alternative means of managing our land or through looking at developments in crop science. Uh, Actually, one of the areas of my own research using artificial intelligence, for example, to look at the more efficient ways of um, farming. Looking at how we can support um, reduction in waste by developing new circular economies. Looking at how we can substantially reduce the emissions from the built environment. Cement and steel are huge emitters and can we find alternative materials, more natural construction materials, for example, to replace the use of cement and steel in our, um, in, in our built infrastructure. But also looking at the way in which we operate our buildings and how we can reduce our energy use in terms of those operations. Looking at industry and how we can develop green um, chemicals and green industrial processes. And then finally, looking at how we can actively remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and draw down um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, either by technological means or by natural means, looking to um, restore our natural world, having that benefit um, both for climate, but also for nature um, at the same time. And within the context of all of this, not only looking at how we transform to a net zero economy, but also being really cognizant of the need to transform to a more resilient economy. So how do we look to um, adapt uh, to the climate change, which is in, in, invariably in, in store, even in the best case scenario, and build more resilience um, to uh, those changes? So in terms of our key findings, um, uh, of what is required to help support a fair, just, sustainable and resilient green recovery. Um, there are um, five key areas that we emphasised in our work. One was the importance of investment, and that's investment not only in um, the technologies and in the nature-based solutions, as I um, described a moment ago, but also investment in green jobs, green training and the education and skills. Investment and support of green infrastructure, and also for helping people to live greener lives, um, looking to um, what institutions need to be put in place um, to help support a um, green net zero future. And that's not only the green policies and regulations, but whether or not we have at a national and international level, the right institutions to help support that. And then, of course, looking at what incentives can be put in place in order to help um, deliver that. We've written a report that you're very welcome to download from the, the, the Cambridge Zero um, website that goes into more details in terms of um, our thinking or across uh, this landscape. I wanted just to end with um, some examples of what we're doing in terms of greening our campus at the University of Cambridge um, and just to give you some insight as to some of the really exciting initiatives that are going on in Cambridge at the moment um, and the three key areas that I wanted to highlight. The first is huge amounts of work looking at how we can develop a net zero campus and uh, for the UK in large parts the most important um, transition that we need to make is to remove our use of gas 
um, in terms of heating. That's the, one of the biggest um, impacts that we have. We're looking at investing in ground source heat pumps, in um, net zero retrofits of buildings, which is complicated in Cambridge, where we have a lot of old and uh, very important architectural buildings. We're looking at um, how we can use the river through Cambridge to extract um, heat from the river uh, as an alternative heating source. But we're also looking much more widely across um, the university. We've introduced sustainable food policy, which has dramatically not only reduced the emissions from the food that we serve to our staff and students, but also looking more broadly at those wider aspects of sustainability, including land use um, that's the food requires, for example. Um, another area that we're focused on is looking at um, travel. Right at the moment, of course, very little travel going on, but ordinarily um, the travel of our uh, students and academics is a substantial part of our environmental footprint. We're looking at the research that we undertake and how we can increase the sustainability of that research, whether that's in terms of the equipment that we use or the computing um, power that we use, how we can design our research to be more sustainable and to have a lower environmental footprint. And then finally, we're looking at how we educate and empower our students. We have a very um, exciting and well regarded program in the University of Cambridge called Eng Engage for Change, which takes um, students on a leadership and empowerment course um, where the, they get together as a cohort, are given training and then undertake their own sustainability um, related projects. So all in all, it's a it's a very exciting um, time in Cambridge. We've drawn together the expertise both to look at what we're doing ourselves, but also how we can contribute to the national and international dialogue associated with it. So I hope that's given you um, some inspiration for some of the things that you might be able to do um, in your own institutions. I'm going to present my university uh, effort in and experience in uh, for a green future. So first of all, uh, uh, Algeria has a geographical position. So uh, we belong to Mediterranean Basin, which is a hot uh, spot. We have uh, and we have a climatic characteristic, which makes Algeria a highly vulnerable for climate change. So Algeria signed for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in, in April 1993, and uh, adhered to Kyoto Protocols in 2005 where it shows a determination to participate in the environmental, uh, in the inter international efforts against climate change and its potential impact on water resources and natural ecosystems. Uh, as a leader in knowledge creation and research, universities are in a unique position to conduct research, educate their students and make significant advancement so, uh, against the climate crisis. So our university uh, policy, in which concern our university policy, so uh, our university tries to develop educational courses, carry out research on our, our environment protection, prevent the waste of water and energy resources on the campus, raising awareness among students and public about the issues concerning pollution and the environment, waste minimization techniques for paper, plastic and inks, also, the implementation of uh, interdisciplinary and international projects like Cupages. Uh, so it's a project for precision agriculture. Uh, and we have another project with the waste management uh, called Agit. So for uh, the project on integrated waste management Agit, it's an Algerian-Belgian cooperation, cooperation project. The project aims to introduce an environmental culture of better waste management waste collection with the use of selective sorting followed by the appropriate recycling method. Uh, the, uh, the, aspect, the edu educational aspect of the project is the creation of an experimental site for educational purposes, introductory courses in waste management and composting of organic matter, the extension of composting processes and improvement of soil fertility in the uh, in Mosagana region, also, the contribution to limiting the global and local environmental impact generated by waste 
management, setting up an, an experimental composting and me, uh, methanization units, uh, so to produce biogas uh, as a fuel, at the agricultural farm of the University of Mostaganem. Here we have an agronomic trial, the effect of compost on seasonal potato yield, spunta variety. So this experiment, uh, experiment was carried out uh, in uh, the experimental farm of the university. So uh, they carried out agronomic trial of locally produced compost in Mosaganem and Sidi Belabes from market waste and crushed green waste. So the aim was to compare the yields of seasonal potato fertilized with compost uh, in comparison with organic or and chemical fertilizer. So as a result, uh, the compost gave a yield of 40 kilogram, uh, the organic fertilizer 36 kilogram and the chemical fertilizer 51 kilograms. So the, the chemical fertilizer was the best, uh, gave the best yield, but in the same time, it has got uh, a bad impact on the environment. So in which concern our student engagement, uh, the university has 15 scientific labs belonging to different faculties created by students. These uh, students are uh, very engaged in uh, environment. Uh, especially the one belonging to the Faculty of Natural uh, Science and Life. So they organize meetings to discuss the problem of the environment and the concept of sustainable development. They try to reduce plastic use, avoiding the use of plastic packaging. Also, uh, in the cooperation of, with the university, uh, they implemented selective trash can for plastic paper and glass for waste recycling. So the university has also different uh, association like renewable uh, uh, energy uh, association and also another association uh, called Friends of Nature. This association uh, aims, uh, aims to spread awareness among students and the public to, pre uh, to protect nature. So we do some volunteering for reforest, uh, reforestation uh, sorry, and contribute to saving the environment, uh, tree planting and cleaning inside and outside the, the campus. So it, uh, every two weeks, uh, the students with uh, their teachers, some teachers, uh, they go hiking in different sites, uh, each time in different sites in order to study the species and the biodiversity of the site and also also do the some cleaning when uh, it's necessary. So these are some photos of our students uh, and uh, some teachers doing uh, a planting uh, at uh, the campus uh, one month ago. So uh, I will conclude my presentation with these photos of uh, an event that uh, took part uh, four days ago, organized by uh, a middle school. So these are kids uh, who try to uh, create art from waste. So they use uh, some waste in order to create uh, these, uh, these art. Uh, I was really impressed about uh, these kids and uh, their work, especially with the boot. I was really fan of this, uh, of this boot uh, with the plants. So uh, this is uh, really an inspiration about uh, the future uh, and uh, the kids thinking about their the future of their planet. I'm not uh, going to share a PowerPoint, but uh, just my experience uh, with uh, this uh, interaction. And uh, I just want uh, to say that the climate change is a global issue and we are all part of the problem, but also the good news is uh, that we are part of the solution. And uh, here we are, we are uh, here uh, as uh, speaking as a, a teacher and a researcher in the green chemistry. And uh, for so many uh, years, we are working on efe in energy efficiency and how uh, uh, it uh, impact the environment. Uh, we can say also that uh, the green chemistry is a field of the chemical engineering or process engineering that include the aspect of uh, environmental uh, context or impact. Okay, in the green uh, chemistry, we use uh, maybe, uh, like uh, Emily said, uh, products they are not uh, nocive for the health or the human health, 
and think about processes that are not consuming much energy uh, than before. And also it's a, a field of uh, chemical engineering that is bringing products that are beneficial both to uh, the, the nature, uh, the sustainability and also for the human being health. Uh, what I can say also about the climate change that uh, this uh, the impact of this climate change it's directly uh, correlated with the health of the human being and the well-being of uh, all of us and uh, that's why I want to share with the, the youth that we have all to increase our level of consciousness about this uh, issue and know that uh, all we have three level of uh, of decision we can make there is the first level is the policy decision we can change policies or uh, orientation and we have another level of decision making it's the management decision level we can uh, have in our uh, institutions or uh, as a manager and the third uh, level of uh, decision making is uh, as personal as human being as a student as, uh, as a citizen and we have all to uh, think today as a global citizen of this earth and make actions to uh, help or to uh, preserve the resources, the natural resources as water, to use more uh, green uh, energy like the solar energy. Here in Algeria we are uh, incubating and uh, uh, startups that makes great uh, impact, uh, gr great impact in this field with uh, using the energy, the solar energy. Uh, and we are in the, the incubator uh, at uh, NP at the Polytechnic School of Argiers, focused on the technological field and the innovation that they use the, the solar energy. And also there is other projects to, me, to, um, uh, to uh, bring uh, new uh, materials like uh, composite materials that we are going to uh, combine a natural uh, product with a synthetic product to have a new products that are more efficient and also more uh, healthy and uh, uh, in uh, environmental uh, friend. Uh, other things we have also projects around the for transportation that can be uh, more efficient and consume less energy. Also, we are uh, here uh, incubation with a uh, uh, project in the agri uh, in the agri tech uh, means the agriculture uh, combined with innovation, like uh, for example uh, the vertical or uh, non-soil agriculture. And this is will uh, provide uh, and save uh, resources as water, but also we can uh, grow uh, the, the amount of production and be more efficient. We know that the climate change uh, are an issue because it affects also the, uh, the nutrition side of the planet. You know, uh, in the bottom of the pyramid in the, uh, the population, in the global population, there is more uh, poor people than uh, uh, rich people. And this uh, sort of uh, uh, agriculture uh, combined with innovation and technology will, will, will bring us more opportunities to feed more people. Uh, and uh, I can say also in... Uh, the the field of the management and the uh, artificial intelligence we here our students are developing project in the management and how to uh, to um, enhance uh, the logistical side of the the uh, the commercial uh, exchange how to uh, save uh, time energy and also transportation uh, if we make less a trans transportation we will save uh, uh, carbon uh, gases that's it uh, we are 
uh, here uh, to also uh, give an idea about this issue that is uh, a very important issue to make um, a change and to develop the economy because when we consume smarter and product smarter we can make more value in the economy balance this is a challenge that needs to be tackled at different levels um, it's very often to uh, to uh, tempting to stand back and say uh, well the government has to fix this whichever government that happens to to be um, or in the workplace or the university or whatever to say it's the management's responsibility. But I think we also have to remember that we as individuals have a role to play too um, in this whole process. And I think by getting that conversation going within the university environments, um, not, <clears throat> not only do you have the potential to influence the uh, the managerial policies, uh, government policies, etc. But um, as as Miriam said as well, you know there is a chance to actually influence human behaviour, and ultimately human behaviour will be critical to the success of uh, of all of this.